So I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be back here. It's been a while since I was here. As Mary said, I'll be um, transitioning. I'll be on the payroll through the end of the year, but I will be, um, we have my uh, successor in, as I said, these guys, well, who are we going to get? I said, look, three things that you'll be certain of, which have proven to be true. You're going to find somebody who's younger than me, smarter than me, and has more hair. They, they got all three in just one shot. It actually worked perfectly. So just as a couple of things, as Mary said, I have worked, I think it's 47, 48 years in some type of government beginning a long, long time ago in Philadelphia. Um, and you look at what's happening today, and there are times when the divide between us as people looks insurmountable. And I get that. When you look at, you know, I, I, I really don't watch TV news after seven or eight o'clock because it really is entertainment and not news. And sometimes just for the heck of it, maybe in between the sports game, I'll flip to Fox or MSNBC. I really get the impression we're living in two different countries when you flip between the channels like that. But I do believe that things are not as bad as they sometimes believe, or in reality, as some people would want them to be, because in my view, too, far too many people, it's in their best interest to divide us. In my view, I think we are much more like all of you here today as Rotarians doing what you can for your community. There are far more people who are engaged in work like you are doing. There are far too many people engaged in charitable organizations, far too many people engaged in trying to bring equality for all people than the people on TV would have you believe who, as I say, in my view, are trying to divide us many times for their own political gain. Um, we are at the ends fragmented. I haven't seen it quite that bad at the end. Um, but I do believe that most people share common principles. And I think eventually we, we will see much more of that. Um, obviously, we have an election coming up. Those of you who are very disappointed to not be seeing the commercials after tomorrow, trust me, they'll be back in a few months. You, you won't have that long to wait. And, of course, Dick can assure you that they will come back as well. So what I'd like to finish today is what, uh, and then leave a bit of time for questions. So as Mary said, I was born and raised in the Philadelphia area, left the state for about seven years, lived in Atlanta for a while, worked for BP that transferred me. So the only problem was I had to go to and, you know, begin speaking a different language, going from speaking Philadelphian to Southern, which you had to learn. Um, found out we talk really fast in the eastern part of the state, particularly, and then moving from there to Cleveland and comparing and contrasting what each of those states brings to it was gave me an important perspective, I think, Then came back here. We've been back here for 30 years almost. Um, and during that time, I've watched, to be honest, not always pleased with how we see public policy debate going. And one to me, one of the things that drives that home is when you look at what's happened in Pennsylvania. Last year, for the 10th consecutive decade, that's correct, 100 years, Pennsylvania lost at least one congressional seat. Well, what does that mean? What it means is, yes, we've lost more cloud in Washington. And unfortunately, not to you know, criticize the papers, but the papers tend to focus on, oh, geez, who's going to lose their seat? Is it Connor Lamb's seat? Is it this seat here? We're going to put those two together without focusing on why it's so important to look at why we have lost another congressional seat. The reality is we are not growing at the same rate as other states. I'm not saying we're losing population. Certain parts of this Commonwealth are losing population, but the reality is we are not growing at the same rate as many other states. And why is that? Because despite the incredible assets we have as a commonwealth, despite some of the best educational institutions in the world, world-class healthcare facilities, proximity to markets, a tremendously motivated workforce. Yes, we have issues in workforce, but a great workforce, people who want to do a good job. Our energy resources, we export energy. We're the number two natural gas producer in the United States, and we need to work on that as well. All of those assets, we continue to stagnate in population. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? You have those assets, but we're, we don't seem to take advantage of them. Um, and the frank answer is this, because we've not made ourselves as attractive to investment as we should. And as I noted earlier, I worked in the South for a while and 
you rarely hear, I mean, people look at people love the talking points on both sides that they go after each side on. And whether it's immigration or whatever, we love to use issues as cudgels and we love to beat the other side with it. And again, and my perspective, as I've seen over the years being in this business, it has gone from I, representing the people here and representing my side over here. I want to work with you. Where can we come to terms and come to some type of consensus and compromise? That's a dirty word now. We not only want to win our issue, we want to beat the living you know what out of the other side because they're evil, horrible people. Just the reality of what we've seen. And the trouble is that in the South, I, I did not hear that in the states that I lobbied. Um, five Southern states plus Illinois, which Illinois is great because Illinois is the only state that in many cases make Pen makes Pennsylvania look good from a corruption basis many years. <laughs> so we tend to, as I said, castigate people, demonize people, and I've seen it here with, with business, the people who are looking to invest in our communities are, are, are attacked in many cases. And as a result, we've created this climate that says, maybe we don't want you here. Be honest, our tax infrastructure keeps investment out. We talked, I talked a little bit about the rhetoric. Um, and interestingly, um, as we, as I said earlier about institutions, we've seen a decline in the trust factor of institutions. Um, the media is, is held low. Congress is held low. The legislature, as one staffer said to me one time, people don't trust us to walk their dog. So unfortunately, those have all gone down. What is still high, despite some of the issues we've had the last couple of years, law enforcement, the military, and small business, particularly someone's employer. So people still hold that. They still say the person that gives me the paycheck each week, if they treat me fairly, I'm going to hold them in high esteem. But the problem is that we have not created a structure that attract, tends to attract the kind of business that we should have given the assets that I talked about earlier. And I'll give you perfect examples. Earlier this year, in the span of about two months, Pennsylvania lost the ability to attract more than $22 billion of investment, not million, that's with a B, $22 billion of investment, $20 billion of an Intel, for those of you familiar, we're trying to re reshore our chip manufacturing for the reasons that we saw during COVID. And that's $20 billion that went to Columbus, Ohio. Another two to two and a half billion was in two steel plants that opted not to build in Pennsylvania. One of them U.S. Steel, another was Nucor. They went to Arkansas and West Virginia, respectively. Why? And the legis and the administration and people people know it. There's this grudging acknowledgement that this is what's doing it. I asked certain folks in the administration, "Did Intel talk to us?" They said they never even kicked our tires. Why? because our corporate net income tax rate is the second highest in the United States, second highest in the United States. It keeps us out. When you look at what happened with the steel facilities, you can also see that the permitting, the time it takes to permit, and I'm not saying don't permit, I'm not saying don't look at it, I'm saying if other states can do it quickly, we should as well. So our permitting structures, our regulatory red tape, I was in Austin, Texas about a month and a half ago, Rep Governor Greg Abbott was there. He talked about all of the investment that they've attracted, and Texas is now the number one university research center in the United States because of their overt attempts to bring it in. His comment was, when they look at permitting, they say they do permitting at the speed of business. That's Texas' slogan, which is why they are doing so well. When you look at the states that did gain population while we lost, California lost, North Carolina, Florida, Texas, Colorado, probably missing one, but those are the ones that gain population. Um, so what do we need to do? What do we need to do? And interestingly, for the first time since I've been here, there is consensus from all four caucuses, as well as the governor, that we need to make our business tax structure more competitive in order to begin attracting it. Because the reality is you can point to it and I've seen some folks say, oh, this is horrible. This is a huge giveaway. This is this, this is that. You can think that if you want. You can say business gets too much. You can say, but business will go elsewhere. Investment follows the path of least resistance. 
And we've put up one heck of a lot of resistance to investment in this Commonwealth. And that needs to change because if we don't, if you're a parent or grandparent in this Commonwealth, if you're tired of getting on a plane to go visit your kids in Raleigh or Austin or Tampa or somewhere like that, then you need to work with us at the chamber because we have a plan to address this. We have a statewide communications plan. We're not gonna say the name because the last two names have been stolen by other people. So we're not gonna say the name today, but you talk to Mary afterwards and she will fill you in on that. Because the reality is we can have all the discussions we want as we do every year appropriately as we look at the budget about how much we should be spending on education. Public education is absolutely critical, no question about it. But until we work this issue out to where we attract more investment, bluntly, when we talk about more spend on education, all we're talking about is how much more we're gonna to spend to educate another state's workforce because that's the tremendous concern that I have. I've got three kids, they're all fortunate enough to be here, um, but that's all we're gonna be doing unless we can turn around the view that business has of this. The, the business view and having worked in uh, doing some mergers and acquisitions work in BP, that's just the perception of what Pennsylvania is. That's the perception. We've got to change that perception that we're not friendly to business. We absolutely have to do it. And as I talked about earlier, when we talk about uniting all of us, I firmly believe that I don't care whether you're in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, whether you're liberal or Democrat, whether you're black or white or whatever the demographics are, people want the same thing. They want a career for themselves. They want good educational opportunities for their children. They want career opportunities for their kids so they can stay nearby. Well, maybe some of you have kids that you'd be okay if they went to another state. I you know, completely understand that. And they want safe streets and neighborhoods. I don't care wh where you are, you all want those. We can disagree on the details about how we get there. But I firmly believe that's what everyone wants. And I believe that's what unites all of us. So I'll just close with this and happy to take any questions. In my view, after so many years in doing this type of work, public policy, political, I served for 10 years on a local government. I've come to firmly believe as I leave more and more in the free market system that powers our economy. And it's for this reason, as someone once said, it's the, the free market slash capitalist system, if you like that, is the worst system ever made with the exception of all the others, yes. There are issues with it. We need to make sure that we've got safety nets for people. We need to make sure that we continue to create equality of opportunity for all of our citizens. But the reality is the free market system is simply one that does this. It trusts each and every one of you to make the best choices on your own each day for you and your families for how you're going to live. And I'm not saying that the people in the legislature or in Congress are, are evil people, that they're not intelligent. They are. But it's what someone once called the the incredible deceit of thinking that you know more than everyone else and you can make these determinations. You know more about what your family and you need moving forward. That's why I, more and more and more I've, I've come to see that I do believe it's the best system for us, which is why I've been so pleased to get up for now 19 years at the chamber and to go fight for that system every day to make sure that it continues. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have in the few minutes we have available. We do have at least five minutes for questions here. Just a, um, a reminder, let Scott Stevens here, uh, he's gonna come around with a mic so that anybody on Zoom can hear the questions as well. Oh. Gene, I know hey, you've Dave. been in very active with the National Civil War Museum. I think you're the past board chair and as well as being a distinguished Civil War historian. Uh, fellow Rotarian Carrie Thomas and I had the pleasure of hosting a meet and greet for the new CEO last year, Jeff Nichols, great guy, and I think he's gonna do a great job. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the future of the museum in terms of the arrangement with a city, which I think is a very novel arrangement, how that's coming, and how the museum, the Civil War Museum and heritage tourism in general uh, play a role in Pennsylvania's uh, economy? 
Thank you, Dave. Great question. So first, I rotated off the board. I've been on since, I don't know, 2006 or seven, but I'm still a strong supporter of the museum. And as you've noted, there is a great plan in place that would sell the uh, artifacts to the museum in exchange for them raising the money, and the money would be put immediately back into Reservoir Park for the community. I think it's a great option. Yeah. So I'm, as I said, I'm I'm bullish on their ability. That they, It's a phenomenal collection. And thanks for your kind words. I still count myself. I know historians. I still count myself as a student of history, by the way. But uh, I think it's one of the most phenomenal collections I've, I've seen. It's one of the most phenomenal in the country. And uh, hopefully, if you've not seen it, you should get up there and see it. Let me address your second question about tourism, which I think is absolutely crucial. And one, I've been on some of your tours, so thank you for what you do to highlight the history of Harrisburg, particularly some of the ones that aren't as known as some of the others. Pennsylvania will be one of the prime states in Philadelphia, one of three major locations, along with Washington, Boston, for the upcoming semi-quincentennial, I believe I have that right, which is America's 250th celebration and commemoration. Um, the last speaker of the house asked me to go on that. I'm his appointee to that, which will talk about what this nation has meant as it's, I always like to say, we're a great nation. We're not a perfect nation, but I believe we are a great nation because of the principles on which we're founded as one historian did say, despite the fact that we had slavery as the birth defect of this American Republic. We're attempting to work through that. I think we'll highlight all of the stories in PA 250. And I think we need to utilize all the activities of America 250 to get people to Pennsylvania to realize the incredibly deep history and the heritage that is this Commonwealth. Yes, you're right. Thank you. I'm done then. <laughs> no, it's a great place to live and work. Thank um, you. Our area seems to be getting a lot of boxes, uh, a lot of storage uh, uh, buildings being built. And of course, lots of trucks on the road. Talk to us about the ID3 tolling of the bridge project and, and mm -hmm. your take on that. Sure. So, uh, so let me address the first. The first is obviously because we are the Keystone State, you've got 80, I 80. The Turnpike, 1581, 78. So we are, and of course, with our access from the Northeast and the East Coast into the Midwest part is, and up into Canada is kind of a natural for us. Uh, those are jobs that, that pay pretty well. Would I like to have had the Amazons of the world? Would I like to have had the Intel chip facility? Absolutely, which will come in my view as we make Pennsylvania more attractive to other investments. Let me touch on the I-83 side. We have to spend we have to agree that we have to put money in to build our infrastructure. Having said that, the chamber is not convinced that tolling one single bridge here is the way to do that. The biggest concern we have isn't necessarily the money, although that will hit commuters. From our perspective, the bigger concerns is what that will do to other surface roads as people divert from there and clog up the other bridges and particularly, as I said, the, those other surface roads. So we have concerns with what that would do as a side effect. Having said that, we have supported more dollars in for infrastructure because like it or not, when you pull into the gas pump and boy, I believe, trust me, having, having been in retail marketing with BP, I always love to look at what the numbers are. How come they're two cents a gallon higher and why are they three cents cheaper? And, but when you pull in and you put the nozzle in your tank, a, a portion, I granted a probably pretty significant portion goes to the federal and state governments for paying for roads, bridges, highways, et cetera. Um, and so that's a, a nature of it is basically a user's fee. But as I've said, I, I, we really don't think that this proposal is the best way to address that because of the, the side issues that would arise from that. Oh, well, done. well, I won't break any road decorum, but if you're interested in the I-83 tolling issue, there is more information on the chamber, Harrisburg Regional Chamber's position on that issue. And we, we agree with Gene. Uh, Gene, I just want to take, take a minute to thank you. You know, I know we've done that a lot. I know Mary did that. I've had the good fortune of working with Gene in my prior role at Team PA. We've traveled France, Germany, Brazil, and Chile together, you know, got to know each other really well over that time. And you've seen, I think, today why the Commonwealth has benefited from Gene's service. He's passionate about Pennsylvania, about its opportunities, and they have a forward-looking plan. 
not all state chamber CEOs do that, right? Uh, chambers sometimes can be organizations of no, uh, don't tax me, don't regulate me, uh, and let the free markets roll. And, and Gene wants to think about what the future holds for his children and all of our grandchildren and children, and we appreciate that, Gene. We're going to miss working with Gene. Um, he's also, we're lucky here to have been an active member of our community, both United Way, the National Civil War Museum, and thanks, Jim. It was great working with you over these years. I know this will be the first of many times, but from the Harrisburg Regional Chamber and Critic, thanks for all you've done.